Praise God. While you're clapping, go ahead and give another hand for our worship team this morning. Wasn't that beautiful? Man, thank you guys so much for leading us in worship uh, this morning. Well, as Pastor Dave said uh, so well, my name is Matthew. Uh, I am a pastor in Dade City, Florida, uh, where I was able to meet Pastor Dave and his beautiful wife, uh, Stephanie, and before even Luke was born, Cadence and Luke, uh, and I've been dear friends with them for a long, long time. Let's give it uh, another hand for Pastor Dave and, his, and Miss Stephanie and the family. Yes, you have amazing pastors, and not just amazing pastors, because a lot of times we can think that a church is the one, you know, who is up here speaking and teaching, but it's so much more. There are so many people working behind the scenes. There, uh, there was someone, uh, Sean, greeted me in the parking lot and, and welcomed me to 12 Church for the very first time in this beautiful facility. And then when I came in, Miss Laura said, do you need anything, Pastor Matt? Can I take care of your son Moses? And then Jaden helped me with my microphone. And, uh, and then I was able to see Blaine and, and a few others. And, you know, there are so many people working behind the scenes, serving God by serving you. That makes everything uh, work. Yes, let's give our uh, all of the volunteers and team members of 12 Church a hand. Thank you guys so much. Well, uh, before we open up God's Word, I am going to pray. And uh, if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4, if you've brought them, uh, it, words will be on the screen or open your phone. We'll be in 1 Peter chapter 4. <clears throat> but before we read God's Word, I do want to pray uh, and share a story with you that I was able to share with uh, the first uh, service this morning. But let's pray together. God of heaven, creator and sustainer of all things. We come before you, God. I pray that we do so openly and willingly and ready to hear from you. God, why would we come if not to meet you face to face? Why would we come to this place if not to be changed by you, to know you, to fall more in love with you? God, I pray that as we dive into your holy word, God, Holy Spirit, reveal to us the scriptures, reveal to us the power and the life within these black words on white paper that our lives may be changed, that the direction of our lives, the perspective of, of ourselves and one another's and ministry and people would change by your word. It, but one word from you can change our life forever. God, I pray that you speak to us. And Lord, anoint me and use me that I'd be nothing more than a microphone, a, a coat to be worn or clay on the potter's wheel that at the end of the day, they'll say, man, I can't remember that guy's name, but man, Jesus was good this morning. Man, I, I'm not even sure all the songs that we sang, but man, I felt so empowered by worship today so that in all things, God, you may receive glory, honor, and praise. I ask this in Jesus' name. If you believe that, would you say amen? Well, I want to share a story with you uh, that I shared earlier this morning. It's one that I, I've known for a while and one that I've come to just love even more so. Uh, but it was the year 265 A.D. So it was around 1700 years ago that in the Roman Empire, which was one of the greatest empires in all of history, they began to have a moment in time that it was very similar to what we have been going through for the past year and a half. But in the year 265 A.D., there was an epidemic, a plague that began to outbreak within the entire Roman Empire. And it was something that didn't just last for a few months or even a few years, but for 15 years, there was this plague that was running rampant in the entire Roman Empire, and it had a mortality rate of one and four. So a quarter of the entire population of the Roman Empire of that day, which just spanned across millions of people and, and tens of thousands of miles, they were fighting a battle, not with, uh, against swords and spears and, and people with shields, but they were fighting for their very lives by something they couldn't even see. And it created so much fear and so much panic within, you know, cities and towns and, and, and the legislation and the, 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 whether they were in the army or they were in philosophy, people began to just be afraid of what they couldn't see. 
And history tells us that the fear was so great that they were literally leaving people behind. That if someone coughed or sneezed or, or they looked like they may have had this, this, this sickness, this, this bacteria or virus, whatever it may have been, they literally would leave mom and dad behind and son and daughter behind for fear that they would catch it and that they would die. There were literally people who would be left on the side of the road to fend for themselves because people were running away out of fear. You know, also during this time, to be a Christian was not a popular thing. You didn't wear a cross necklace. You didn't have a 12 church t-shirt that you wore. To be a Christian almost meant certain death, if not severe persecution. And so not only are Christians, you know, still trying to flourish and to thrive, you know, uh, with the birth of the new church just a hundred years before, but they're also now facing this plague. And so while people in these cities, they were known, they were being seen running away. I mean, literally packing what they could grab on a cart and a buggy or a mule, and they were running out of the cities. And while they are running away for their lives, it's known in history that Christians were then running to the cities, running into the towns, running to those homes of the people who were sick. That they said uh, the, the love of God that he has for us and the love of Jesus that he has for them and the fact that this world is but a drop in the bucket compared to eternity, those people are dying not just alone, but they're dying without hope. And they were running into the city saying, you know, if I can just give you some water, some bread, if I can just bandage your wounds, if I can just present an opportunity of love and action, then maybe I can share about the true hope, the true life, which is Jesus Christ. You know, it's even in your history books. You won't read this unless if you really look it up on the internet. But history will tell us that not only did the Christians who said, I'm going to live for others more than myself, help uh, fuel the flames that were of the church of that day, but they saved countless lives by just tending to the needs of others. They were willing to lay their life down even unto death that someone else might have a life, might maybe to live, even if it's for a few more days, weeks, or months, they were willing to sacrifice themselves. You know, the thing I love so much that history even tells us, I didn't tell the first service this, but history tells us that the Christians that were going into these towns, something began to happen because they were so motivated and I believe called and anointed by the Holy Spirit to do that, that Christians, one, they were either not getting sick so those who were sick were coming to them, why aren't you getting sick? But if they did get sick, they were recovering faster than those outside of the grace of Jesus Christ. So much so that it was just a few hundred years later by that impact of what they were doing, that Christianity went from being illegal to the national religion of the day by the actions of men and women. And it wasn't what propelled the church of Jesus Christ, it wasn't the building of buildings and mega churches and, and steep. It wasn't the fact that they, they were able to give copious amounts of money. You know, they didn't have a lot of money because they seen uh, to the needs of others above themselves. They would literally sell homes and, and cattle and they would sell land to be able to help the poor who was in need. And it wasn't the fact that they had Bibles of every translation, of every size and shape that they put in the hands of everyone because they didn't have Bibles in the year 265 AD. They had word of mouth. They had some things that they would write down that they experienced. But what changed the world as we know it for the sake of Christ and all of Christendom was men and women who said, I am going to live my life for someone else more than myself. I am going to seek the needs of others more than that of myself. I'm going to let this man or this woman know they are not alone, that I don't know if they'll get healed. I don't know if they'll get better. But by opening this door to their homes to tell them that someone loves them, God may be able to open up the door of their hearts for them to be able to become born again. And it was through the actions of men and women just like you and just like me, but chosen and called and anointed that changed the world forever. You know, Pastor Dave and his amazing team, you guys have been going through a series for the past few weeks called Why? Who's been enjoying the series so far? Someone say something, man. It's been good. I've been watching online. But the series called Why? And it's been going into why we as Christians, why we as the church do what we do. 
You know, I don't have to, you know, remind you or convince you of this, but it is really easy for someone to do the right thing for the wrong reason. You know, some of you parents in this room, I have two children, a five-year-old Moses and a two-year-old Benji, and my five-year-old Moses, he may clean his room, but he does it with a huff and a puff and, and just trying to do it so that way he can watch Thomas the train. You know, he may be doing the right thing, but he's doing it out of the wrong reasons, and that doesn't make me feel very good as a father. I'm like, Moses, you should be thankful. Look, you have all these trains. You should just want to clean them, and, and you should be thankful for the roof of your head and, and, and all the things that you have. You should just want to clean your room and be grateful to your almighty father who is the greatest in the world and loves you beyond all fathers and of all fathers in the world. But you know, sometimes it's easy to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. And that's why I love this series that you've been in so much because Pastor Dave has been opening up God's word to take the what of maybe worship the what of generosity and giving, uh, the what uh, of church and community, and he's breaking it down to the why we do those things. Why do we come together as Christians in the faith, brothers and sisters? Why do we give out of ourselves so that others may be blessed? Why do we fellowship as a community? And today we're going to be looking at God's Word, and we're going to look at the why behind the what of service. The why behind the what of serving one another. Someone just say amen. We're going to be jumping into God's word. We're in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. It'll, probably, it'll be on the screen. Actually, it's right there for you. But let me read out loud, and I want you to follow along with me. These are the words of Peter written for us today. It says, be alert and sober-minded, so that you may pray. Verse 8, above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. But if we were having a modern translation of that of ourselves, it may say, and each of you should use whatever gift you have to serve yourself, to help yourself, to take care of you, me, myself, and I. But this translation, God's Word tells us that we have been given a gift so that we may use it to serve one another. And we keep going as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. We'll end in verse 11. Peter says this, And if anyone speaks, they should do so as if one who speaks the very words of God. And if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all, someone say all, so that in all things God may be praised through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he ends with, to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And as I read these words of Peter, myself, you may not find it this way, but for myself, I find the most glorious and greatest why behind the what when it comes to serving others. Peter tells me the greatest reason why I seek to serve others and not just myself. He says it right there in the end of verse 11, when we serve others through the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through the Lord Jesus Christ. Why we serve others, why you may serve at 12 Church, why you may serve as a counselor, why you may serve at a shelter, why you may serve uh, for someone at a, a young lady at a pregnancy center, why you do those things may be able to help them. But as Christians, we should be motivated with the why behind the what of the words of Peter says, so that through our service, through our actions, God may receive praise through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. That when we know what we do is good, but the reason why we do it is so God can get glory, it changes everything about what we do. 
You know, I know you at 12 Church, I know you know this. You just got going, going through the why of worship recently. Pastor Dave laid out such a firm foundation of the why behind the worship. But the reason why this is so beautiful is because worship to God shouldn't just be set apart on a Sunday morning for three songs. Worshiping Jesus isn't just singing a song on Joy FM on your way to work or your way home. You know, worship to God isn't just something in which we say, but it's a life in which we live. That is the greatest love song. That is the greatest worship. That is the greatest act of adoration and gratefulness that when our lives display the change that is in our heart and motivated by love, we just begin to love God in everything we do. We respect our husbands because we love God. We love our wives more than ourselves because we love God. We obey our parents in the Lord for this is right because we love God. But everything we do then can become an act of worship when we choose to live for others more than we live for ourselves. You know, even your life can be the greatest hymn ever sang or not sung by your life that is being lived for the glory of God. That in heaven, there could be just a hymnal of all the things you've done, and it just brings glory to God if it was sang out loud. You know, there's one thing I, I, I love so, so much. I love quotes. And I have a couple of quotes that are going to put on the screen for you. Uh, and I love to learn by them. And, and so these are even men and women outside of the church who are going to point to the purpose and the, the need of our lives being served for others. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, The purpose of life is not to be happy. And he steps on our toes. He says, The purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful. It is to be honorable. It is to be compassion. And it is to make a difference. And Frank said this, No one has ever became poor by giving. Man, I love that one so much. No one has ever truly became poor by giving to others. Charles Dickens said this, No one is useless in this world who lightens the burdens of another. That's one of my favorite ones. I have one more, but that's my favorite one. No one in this world is useless if your life is lived to lighten the burdens of one another. Your life can have meaning. Your life can have impact. Your life can have purpose. Your life can have uh, uh, great uh, opportunities uh, to be able to make change in someone's life or in people's lives by just elevating and lifting the burdens of one another. All of us here at one time or another, we have been changed because someone allowed us to cry on their shoulder. Someone allowed us to call them in a moment of need. Someone wrote us a letter to say it's going to be okay. All of us are here and you can remember a time when someone chose to go outside of themselves for us and how it made us feel. It gave us hope. And when we choose to live for others, when we choose to serve, whether at 12 Church or our neighbors, we are agents of hope to remind that person that greater things can be ahead of you, that you are not alone, that I may not have the answers, but I'm here with you as we walk through life together. And the last one is this. It's the Roman philosopher Cicero. He said this, I think, in 40 AD, so not too long after the birth of Christ, or before the birth of Christ, he said this, Non nobis salome, which is Latin, it means this, not for ourselves are we born. Not for ourselves are we born. And that can be a little hard to grasp because we live in such a culture, we live in such a time and place where it's all about making sure you're happy, making sure you're taken care of, making sure you get rich or you die trying, making sure that you take care of I, making sure uh, you worry about yourself. And we live in such a self-central kind of, uh, you know, just generation uh, of people today that the idea of living for others more than ourselves is very foreign for a lot of people. But Jesus lays out the foundation for us and the Holy Spirit inspired uh, the, the, uh, Peter, the apostle, to write to us to say so that when we live for others, we're doing it through the strength God provides with whatever gift we have been given so that God may be worshipped and praised through your life. 
You know, one of the things I love, he says, use whatever gift you have received to serve others. I love that. Use whatever gift you have received to serve others. You know, this is, goes without saying, but you can look around the room. There's not two of us who look the same, who act the same, who came in here with the same exact outfit on, who came in here with maybe the same, exi- uh, same shoes or, or drove in the same exact car. All of us are so different. You have different passions. You have different desires. You have different things that make you happy. You have different things that make you sad. Some of us, we have different giftings and talents. You can do woodworking, or you know how to do AutoCAD, or you can sing, or you can play an instrument. All of us are so unique. And Peter says, use whichever gift you have been given to serve others. Whatever that gift is, God has given you that gift with an expectation that you will give that gift away. Every gift that God has given you, God, I promise you, you can find it through all of the totality of Scripture. Every gift and blessing that God gives us, He expects us to then be a blessing to someone around us, to then be a blessing to our neighbors, a blessing to our church, to use that gifting and that talent that isn't just going to create our momentum, isn't just going to create a podium for, a podium for us to stand on or a mountain for us to see on top on, but He has given us this gift that we may give it to the world that we may use it for the glory of God. And I love that. That we don't need 16 people up on stage who are all playing the guitar. We don't need 16 decar, decar, <laughs> excuse me, guitar players. But what we need is someone who's going to play guitar and also be able to open the door for someone. We need someone who can sing, and we also need someone who can type in the notes. And we need someone who can preach, just as we need someone who then can live out the gospel in which we have heard in an act, practical way so that people will not just hear us, but they'll see us. You know, it's, it's kind of in debate on if really St. Francis was, of Assisi said this, but St. Francis is accredited to saying, preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. And I know there's like a dividing rod between those who love that and those who hate that, but it's so true because I'm telling you, people care more about what you show than they care about what you know. At the end of the day, people will always care more about what you show than what you know. And you can say all the right things, but if you're living all the wrong ways, it's going to negate everything that you've said. And so this world is looking not to us for just to, uh, you know, practice what we preach, but I think it's even changed. I think that they're waiting for us to preach what we've already been practicing. They're ready for us to be able to share the good news once we have been living the good news, to tell them about hope when we are already full of hope, to be able to tell them that there is life beyond that of ourselves by the ways that we've already been living it around us. And I promise you, when you live out the gospel, you have an opportunity to then share the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's in that moment that that simple act of kindness or that simple act of opening a door or serving one another can then open up the door to somebody's heart to be able to receive Jesus. You know, I remember my youth pastor told me this, and I and this is not, it didn't get on, he didn't say this in a goofy way because there's like a weird, you know, sect of Christianity that take this to the extreme. But he said, Matt, you have to remember that when you're in school, you may be the only reflection of Jesus that that person's ever going to see. That you may be the only person that looks like Jesus, talks like Jesus, that they may ever see in their life to live your life so much like Christ that you just exemplify surrender and humility and love and sacrifice that when they look at you, they're just going to have to say there's something different about you, Matthew. I don't understand why you would do this and why you would offer that and why you would sacrifice this. And it presents us with an opportunity. Say, you're right. I'm not good. I'm not a nice guy. I'm not a great person. I'm not just caring, but there's someone who loves me so much and out of the abundance of my love for him, I just love one another. I just have to live my life of love for him by love for one another, by the things in which I say and the things in which I do. You know, I love the ability that church, that 12 Church has been able to give to you guys, for there is so many ways that you have an opportunity to use whatever gift God has given you to serve Him by serving this church. 
There are some of you who would be terrified to stand up here on a podium, but you are more than happy to be behind the scenes and no one ever see your face or know your name. And here at, at a 12 church, they have something called starting point. You know, I, it's going to be next Sunday. We just had a, a, a session this morning at 10. Next Sunday at 10 a.m., it's called starting point. And what they do is they sit down for 30 minutes. They'll share about the mission and vision of 12 church. They'll tell you about the leadership of Pastor Dave and his amazing team. They're going to be talking about how you can become a partner and not just serve, but being a partner in the ministry here at 12. And then they're going to present an opportunity for whatever gift you have been given, whatever passion and talent and desire to say, all right, we want to champion that. We want to help you thrive with that. We're going to help you be the very best flag guy in the parking lot that we have ever seen. You're going to do more cartwheels to get people to park cars, and it's going to be amazing. You're going to be the cartwheel guy that people know 12 church about, but using that gift in such a way that then glorifies God and you're able to do that just by getting plugged in at 12 church. Tomorrow, not, not tomorrow, but next Sunday at 10 a.m., come a little early, early before this service. You'll come in and have an opportunity to see, man, maybe there is something for me to be able to serve. Maybe there is something I can do. Man, my whole life, no one, no one has ever told me I'm good at anything. Many of us, we were raised in homes like that to where we never got attaboys. We never got congratulations. We didn't get the trophies. We didn't get the certificates. But here at 12 Church, they want to champion you to be able to glorify God by serving one another. I love that so much. You know, one of the things that I was looking at the scriptures, I want us to take just a moment to we'll look at this analogy and really meditate on just the the mystery of the mathematics of this scripture. So Peter, in 1 Peter 4, 7, he says this, or 4, or 11, he says, so that in whatever gift, use it to serve others, so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. I love that. He says, you are to use your gift and use that gift to serve others. And by serving others, God gets glory. You know, that's kind of flip-flop of society. It's we want to use our gifts so that we get the glory. We want to work hard so that we get the accolades. We want to be able to, to be in a position where everyone knows our name. But Peter is telling us, you serve with the gift that God has given you to serve others. And in the end, God is going to get praise. This is how kind of uh, the mystery of that mathematics works. You know, just a few months ago, Dave's favorite football player of all time was able to lead the Tampa Bay Buccaneers into a Super Bowl since what 2002 amazing and so in this moment the Bucks win the Super Bowl you know what the crowd didn't do the crowd weren't cheering for Brian Glazer or Glazer. They weren't going, Brian, Brian. They didn't rush his, his box and pick him up on the shoulders and carry him saying, Brian, because Brian, he owns the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But what did happen is they began to yell, Brady, Brady. They began to yell, Rob Krakowski and Rob, Rob and Tom. And says, you threw the touchdown and you caught it and ran to the touchdown. They were cheering for the players. That's what makes sense. No one ever goes behind the sins and says thank you to the water boy or, or thank you to uh, the head coach of statistics or whatever it may be or the owner, but you give credit to the one who's doing the work. But in the kingdom of God, as children of God, as Christians, when we serve others through the power of God, motivated by the love of God, we don't get the glory. We shouldn't get the glory, but we give God all of the praise, honor, and worship. I love that because it takes it off of you and makes it all about him. When the why isn't about what you're doing, but in whom you're doing it for, everything changes. You know, even Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That word see in the Greek, I won't break down, you know, the Greek word, but that word see in the Greek isn't just to perceive with your eyes, but that word in the Greek literally holds the way to be experienced by your being. 
Jesus is saying, when people see your good works, when they are in experiencing your good works, where they are impacted by your service for them, they are in turn going to glorify God. It is that moment of impact that you can have on someone else's life that they experience your act of kindness, that they can experience the act of greatest kindness when Jesus laid his life down on a cross instead of us. They can experience the love of God through you. They can experience the grace of God through you, the mercy of God by our lives lived for him. I live for this stuff, guys. I live for this stuff because me, man, we got time. You don't have to be anywhere right now. And so here, rabbit trail, then we'll jump right back onto it. You know, I'm just going to tell the truth and shame the devil and tell it like it is. You know, we talk about how the church is full of uh, hypocrites. You know, that's one of the biggest reasons why people don't come to church or maybe why you left church or maybe why you're on the fence. And this is true. You know, there was ne- there's never going to be anything as a perfect church as long as there are imperfect people that are coming to church. I'll just leave that right there. But the thing that I love is we like to talk about you know, the hypocrisies of someone who embezzles money or someone who drinks, you know, at the bar on Saturday, then comes to church on Sunday. Or we like to talk about the hypocrisy of someone who's looking at what they shouldn't be looking at on their phone. But you want to know what I think the greatest hypocrisy in the church today is? Is men and women, children of God, who sing about the love of God on a Sunday morning, but are full of hate on a Monday. The thing that is the greatest hypocrisy in the church is men and women who say, I love the amazing grace that that, that was sweet the sound that I was lost, but now I'm found. But yet they won't forgive anyone. They won't give grace to anyone. You turn your back on them and they write you off and never talk to you again. Or someone who loves the mercy of God but does it display the mercy of God? That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. That when our lives do not mimic the God in which we serve, when our words don't reflect the words of Jesus, that is what the world's going, I don't understand. Why would I want to do what you're doing if you're just like me, but you say you have something else and it doesn't look any different? So as believers, as sons and daughters of God, We should want to love God by mirroring God, by mirroring and reflecting Jesus. Even the Scriptures tell us that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve one another by ransoming us all from sin. That Jesus, if anyone in history deserved deserved to be worshipped and glorified and honored and waited upon, intended to, it would be Jesus But he left his throne of glory to be born in a manger. He set down his crown of righteousness to then pick up a cross. He he set aside his sword so that he can be humble and lowly. It is in that moment that God sent his son through the love that he had for us, that he sent Jesus to serve us by dying instead of us. And that, is our, that should be our life's mission, to love others with that same love, to love our church, to love our neighbor, to love our family, to love those we know and complete strangers in such a way that our lives are just marked by something that has got to be of God. And it starts as easy as serving somebody else by loving on someone You will never know this side of heaven, the impact you can make that when you go to a a restaurant today and you go to pay your bill and you play your bill and you ask the waitress or the waiter and say, hey, what's your name? Oh, my name's Julie. Hey, Julie, I just want you to know, I'm just going to be praying for you. You know, I don't know what's going on in your life. It may be good, it may be bad, but I just want you to know that I'm going to be praying for you. And I'm going to get a couple other people in my church and we're going to pray for you as well. And next time I see you, I just hope that things are so much better than they are right now. You have no idea what that can do in somebody's life by just serving them in such a way, by just telling them you're going to be praying for them. You know, the reason I became a pastor isn't because I love the accolades. I hate them. I don't like being up here. You can ask Pastor Dave. I don't like it very much. I would much rather be running the slides back there than up here preaching to you. I'm a behind the scenes kind of guy. I I don't enjoy the limelight, but the reason I became a pastor is not for, for people to see me or to hear me. It's not because everyone loves what I do and is always so thankful to Pastor Matt and, and is so gracious to what I do. It isn't because I'm making buku money. Trust me, none of those 
those things. Trust me, I definitely would never even make buku money if I could. And so, but, but all of those things, none of it is my motivation, but what I do, the why behind what I do is from the overflow of love that I have for Jesus. You know, I won't go through the story. I've already had one rabbit show and you're only allowed one rabbit show when you're a guest speaker at another man's church. And so, uh, but there's the story of when the woman anointed the feet of Jesus and everyone was so indignant and outraged. And at the end of that, Jesus says to the one who has been forgiven much, loves much. And I don't know about you, man, I'm not going to cry. I don't know about you, but I have been forgiven of a lot. Jesus had to forgive me of a lot. And it took a lot of love to love me. And out of that love that he has for me, I have got to love him back. There is no other option of loving him back. You can love him as a janitor just as much as I love him as a preacher. You can love him just as much as a single mom as you can as a family of 16. You can love God in everything that you do by living for yourself, or not living for yourself, by living for God and not yourself. I live this because I love him. And if tomorrow the church said, we don't want you here anymore. We, we got another pastor. Uh, we're, we're just, we need you to go a separate way. I would still love God just as much tomorrow as I did today. I would still seek to serve the good of others tomorrow as I'm doing today. Because it's just a natural overflow of my love for him. You know, the... What we do and why we do must be deeply rooted not in what we do and not in the persons and for what we do and to them or for them, but our root, our foundation of why we do and what we do should be for in whom we do it. And the reason that's so important is because if you serve others for the sake of others, that will get old really fast. Because the moment someone doesn't thank you for opening up the door, you're going to get offended. The moment that you are flagging someone down in the parking lot and instead of parking here, they drive past you and park over there, you're going to go, man, I can't believe to do that. Or, or the moment you sing up here and, uh, and you lead an amazing service and all of a sudden you just hit one wrong note and someone comes up to you and says, man, that was great, except for that mistake you made. You're going to go, what am I doing? But when we make why we do and what we do for and whom we do it for, God sees what we're doing, knows what we're doing, and will forever remember what we do for him by living for others. And when we make it about God our Father, when we make it about Christ his Son, when we make it about the inspiration and the power and leading of God Holy Spirit in us, that is a well that will never run dry. Here, let me prove it to you. Right here in Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to be ending on this. Hebrews chapter 6. Don't take my word for it. Let's listen to the writer of Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. He says this, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown Him as you have been helping or serving His people continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that you, your hope may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy. You know, I told the first service, the greatest uh, antidote for laziness is serving someone else more than yourself. The greatest antidote for being lazy or complacent is to say, I'm going to do something good for somebody else and not just for myself. That is the antidote for laziness. But he goes on to say, but imitate those through faith and patient inheritance what has been promised to you. You know, once again, just like earlier, the mathematics of this doesn't really make sense. But God says, I will never forget the love you have shown me. Not because you went to 50 out of 52 Sundays out of the year. 
Not because you, you decided to give everything of your possessions away. Not because you have 12 different Bible translations. All of those things are good. All of those things are great. But God is telling us in the scripture, he will never forget the love you have shown him by the act of serving somebody else, by loving somebody else. God is in heaven recording every single time someone serves at 12 Church or Redemption Church. Every single time you help your neighbor with their trash or you mow someone's lawn or, or you help out a homeless shelter or a pregnancy center. Every time you do that because you love God and you want to love others, God is taking note and one day all of it will be made known. And He'll say, you know, this day and 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 6 days ago, and everything will be made known. And he said, you showed me so much love by loving someone else. I love that. I love the fact that we are able to worship God every day, all the time, and in every opportunity by living for somebody else, by serving here today. Worship here at, at 12 Church wasn't just at the beginning, but it's even going on now by the people who are wor worshiping God by serving our children over in Kids Church, by the people who are behind the scenes. The worship service goes on from start to finish because people are still serving others. And we can partner with that. We have an opportunity where we can be able to serve at 12 Church or the church that you call home. Or we have an opportunity to serve others by our loving our neighbors and glorifying God in all that we say, think, and do. And I love that. Because I don't know about you, I can't get enough of worshiping God. I can't sing to get enough of honoring Him, but I can't sing all day, every day. Trust me, no one wants to hear me sing all day, every day, but by my actions, I'm able to glorify God and show Him such a great love by loving someone else. Now, would you make a vow with me? Maybe a promise, I'm not gonna have you raise your right hand. I'm not gonna have you do the, the scout's honor motto or anything like that, but just between you and God, can you just make a vow, a promise, a determination that God, whatever gift you have given me, may I use it for your glory. God, I'm a business owner. May my business glorify you. God, I work for the man. But God, may my job here praise you from Jesus Christ. God, I just, I'm just parking cars, but Lord, if parking cars can glorify you, then Lord, let it be a sweet, sweet song. And I promise you, God loves to answer prayers like that, 12 Church. Say, God, help me to help others. God, whatever gift and passion you have been given to me, may it be for others. May it be really for you, but through the action of loving one another. And I promise you, if you pray that kind of prayer, it comes with a warning because God loves to answer prayers like that. That when you sincerely go to him and you ask him, God, help me to worship you through helping others, serving others, being sacrificial, acts of kindness, I promise you, he will put people in your life every day to test you, to try you, for you to have an opportunity to prove your words in that moment through action. I wanna end before I pray with one of my favorite poems. I've had this poem in whether my home or my office for the past 15 years. And it was written by a man named Charles Meggs almost 200 years ago. It goes as follows. He says, Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayers would be for others. Help me in all the work I do to ever be sincere and true and know that all I do for you must needs be done for others. When my work on earth is done and my new work in heaven's begun, may I forget the crown I've won while still thinking of others. Others, Lord, others. May this my motto be, Help me to live for others that I may live like thee.